Oripix is thrilled to be sponsoring the lunch symposium today. We subscribe to the notion that the right dose of technology and collaborative provider support can have a dramatic and positive impact on patient outcomes. Today, Dr. Armstrong will be walking us through a variety of technologies that really aim to empower patients to take a more active role in their disease management and prevention. No one is better suited to present on this topic than him, in our opinion. Dr. Armstrong is as technology savvy and connected as they come, and he's the first to champion any innovation when he feels that his patients could benefit as a result. Dr. Armstrong is professor of surgery with tenure at the University of Arizona. He also holds a Master of Science in Tissue Repair and Wound Healing from the University of Wales College of Medicine and a PhD from the University of Manchester College of Medicine, where he was appointed Visiting Professor of Medicine. He also co-founded the Southern Arizona Limb Salvage Alliance. Dr. Armstrong has produced more than 375 peer-reviewed research papers in more than three dozen scholarly, scholarly medical journals, as well as over 50 book chapters. He is co-editor of the Diabetes, American Diabetes Association's Clinical Care of the Diabetic Foot, now in its second edition. Dr. Armstrong was selected as one of the first six international wound care ambassadors and is the recipient of numerous awards and degrees by universities and international medical organizations, including the inaugural Georgetown Distinguished Award for Diabetic Limb Salvage. In 2008, he was the 25th and youngest ever member elected into the Podiatric Medicine Hall of Fame. He is the 2010 and youngest ever recipient of the ADA's Roger Pecoraro Award, the highest award given in the field. Dr. Armstrong is past chair of scientific sessions for the ADA's Foot Care Council and a past member of the National Board of Directors of the American Diabetes Association as well as a former commissioner with the Illinois State Diabetes Commission. He sits on the Infectious Disease Society of America's Diabetic Foot Infection Advisory Committee. And in 2011, he was appointed chair of the World Diabetic Foot Commission of the FIP, representing clinicians from more than 30 nations. Dr. Armstrong is the founder and co-chair of the International Diabetic Foot Conference, DEFCON, of course, the largest annual international symposium on the diabetic foot in the world. So without further ado, if you can join me in welcoming Dr. Armstrong. Thank you. Holy cow. Okay. After that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and ladies and gentlemen at home, you can only be disappointed. So uh, buckle up. Um, has this, this has just been a lot of fun. I don't know how you guys, I know you're all periprandial, but uh, if you, this has just been a really, I've been having such a good time at this meeting, and I want to thank all the speakers and everyone, and I'm just going to give you them a round of applause for myself. Uh, but, uh, and it's, uh, it's uh, crashing the servers uh, back there every day. It's really unprecedented. You guys okay backstage? Oh, good, excellent. All right. Um, so listen, we're going to actually cover uh, quite a lot of ground in our short period of time today, um, and uh, it's, it's uh, a bit ambitious, but we'll see. Oh, FYI, if, uh, if you want to copy any of this or take any of the slides or anything, we are really open source with all of our stuff. We just give it away, uh, and uh, not that there's anything really to take, uh, but you got it if you want it. There's my email, and you can follow us, and... You can go to the website or the blog, and it's, we try to really keep it up to date, up to the second, you know, with uh, any data you want. And you're welcome to any of this stuff if you ever want to use it yourself, uh, in our because uh, we're just a big collective family, aren't we? So anyway, and that includes all of you at home watching in your underwear, um, or maybe you have one of those onesie, headsy, heady, footy underwear things. Um, but we're going to try to cover a couple of things. First, we're going to ask ourselves, why is any of the things that we're going to discuss now, technology aside, why is this whole thing important? Why are we even here? Um, and where is where are we going in the future of, uh, of this entire space? Um, I, I tend to think that it's both a disturbing and an exciting time, sort of the most in the Dickensian sense, kind of the best and worst of times in one time. But then we're going to talk to ourselves about how we manage and really, I think, prevent severe wounds. I, and I, I don't believe that we can prevent 
wounds. Um, uh, that may sound heretical to some, but I just, I think that these people that we treat, particularly after they're healed, are in remission. And, and we, I think, however, we can mitigate the severity. And that's going to be the denouement of what we talk about as we kind of really ratchet ourselves toward the end where we start looking at various kinds of technologies that might be able to help us and augment us for low cost, uh, it, not only here in uh, the United States and Hollywood, but frankly around the world. So anyway, enough of that. Let's, uh, let's do this. We'll, uh, we won't look at any data right now, but we are going to look at one year. Um, and this was back when we had DEF CON 9. Uh, and uh, we, we didn't know it, but when we were all together uh, then, uh, this was probably the most important year uh, in any of our lives. Uh, uh, wh whatever we were doing personally, it was probably the most important year. And why? Um, it's because of this. Uh, because for the first time in the history of us as a species, more folks died that year of non-communicable diseases, NCDs, uh, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, uh, pulmonary disease, than from all of the plagues in the world combined, all of them. Uh, and, and that is probably the most important thing we can talk about in this meeting, frankly, or frankly any uh, medical meeting. And, and then, so you take those big three, cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and then you make a microcosm of those, and, and here we go, that same year, uh, so buckle up because diabetes passed HIV AIDS since HIV AIDS became an important uh, 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 cause of uh, uh, morbidity and mortality uh, in the 80s and 90s. So that, that was the year that that happened as well. So, and before you start saying to yourself this is a disease of uh, rich people and rich countries, uh, let's understand that four out of the five deaths from any of these NCDs, these, any of these non-communicable diseases, including diabetes, are occurring in the developing world. So this is a problem uh, across our landscape as a, as a family in our area uh, and, uh, and in, with many of our colleagues in other disciplines uh, within medicine and, and, and surgery and science. So it, it maybe forces us collectively, you know, not as doctors and nurses, uh, uh, but as people maybe, uh, to take a little bit different view of the world. And, and, and let's do that because um, maybe it'll be helpful. And I would uh, defer actually to Steve Jones, who's a really terrific uh, guy. He's become kind of a science pundit uh, in the UK. He sits on the UK Stem Cell Foundation. And he uh, talked about uh, uh, not the three ways that we've lived throughout the eons, uh, but the three ways that we've died. And, and uh, let's do that together. Let's get a little bit macabre uh, at lunch while you're periprandial, but let's, uh, let's go there. Uh, so the first way that we died as a species was this way, by, by, uh, by disaster. We'd, uh, we'd uh, get eaten by a you know, saber-toothed tiger or fall off a precipice, uh, something like that. There were uh, the tigers and uh, sharp objects involved. But, but we, got, we got smart, and we, we circled the wagons uh, you know, after uh, you know, uh, uh, a couple few million years of this, and maybe uh, 30,000 years ago or a little bit later, we started uh, moving into uh, collectives and, and uh, the first villages, uh, and we stopped dying so much of disaster, and we started dying, of course, of, uh, of, of disease. So, you know, pick your plague. Arsenia pestis, uh, Vibrio cholera, uh, typhus, uh, you know, dengue fever, you, you name it. And, and this has been us. It still is us. Too many people are dying of, uh, of, of preventable problems like this and treatable problems, but a, 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 f a switch was flipped, and, and we, we, we passed this a few years ago, and, and there might be little fibrillations here and there over the next decades, but the bottom line is we're moving from disaster to disease, and now we're moving to this. We are moving to decay. And, and we are dealing now as a species and as a global family with, uh, with replacement parts. All of these, disease, these NCDs, including diabetes, are diseases, I would argue, uh, of decay. And maybe that could be another way for us to, to look at the world. So of that, if we're talking about that, those diseases of decay, diabetes, uh, cancer, heart disease, but specifically diabetes, within that area, uh, we know that the foot, and I don't need to, <laughs> I think we're preaching to the converted, that the diabetic foot complications in this context are, are a significant issue. They're common, they're complicated, and just to be alliterative, they're costly. 
Um, and and, uh, and let, let's look at just a little bit of this. If we see here this sort of Venn diagram, uh, courtesy of Neil Barshas on a paper that we just uh, wrote, looks a little like a, like a bubble bath, but th these sort of things that we see every day collectively, uh, you know, these are very big public health problems. So we see diabetes and nearly as big as peripheral artery disease, almost as big as that within diabetes is one of the end stage complications, which is not so end stage really. It's peripheral neuropathy and wounds and, and uh, more severe limb ischemia and ultimately loss of limb. But these problems are, uh, and, and these bubbles in many parts of the world are, are expanding. Um, it's like an expanding universe. And, and it's, it's, it's disturbing because that costs a lot of money. Um, and, and you might ask, well, uh, uh, why do I put this up? And you already, you've, you've seen these, this throughout the meeting, people talking about the diabetes, diabetic foot uh, being similar to cancer. And actually, it's not a bad analogy in, in some ways. It kind of holds up as an analogy. But you've seen these data uh, a lot but, uh, with, about uh, death rates. But let me just show you uh, these, which are relatively new. And you've seen these in various iterations throughout the meeting. But uh, these are uh, just from a couple of months ago. Um, and uh, you see that uh, diabetic lower extremity complications now are more expensive than the five most expensive cancers in terms of direct costs um, uh, with the best data available. So. I guarantee you, outside of this room, short of the radio show that's going on outside of here, there's no one else talking about feet and toes and whatnot and diabetes. But there's plenty of people talking about breast cancer and colon, colon cancer. It's probably a, uh, you know, a, a walk-a-thon or a bike-a-thon or something, and lung cancer and these other problems. And, and maybe we could do better. And I was actually talking to um, my friend and, and intellectual superior, uh, Professor uh, Dave Margolis, about this just about uh, 10 minutes ago. Um, and and it's, it's, a, it's, it's an important problem that we don't talk enough about. And you've already seen these data, I think, probably 100 times at this meeting, so I'm, let me be the 101st. We, we wouldn't think of withholding therapy on someone, God forbid, with lung cancer uh, or colon cancer or breast cancer unless they asked for it. But this kind of problem, happen, this, this nihilism happens all the time in people with wounds and with uh, common problems associated with diabetes and diabetic foot uh, where, where we just say, you know, this, pr this patient just has a problem. They're just going to get another one. Uh, it's a foregone conclusion. It's a fait accompli. Let's just cut the thing off and be done with it. And you've heard some good arguments to suggest that maybe we should do that in some people, but probably not, I should think, in most. Um, and, and I think uh, we can probably do a lot better, and that's why we all come together uh, as a family together to try to effect change. So anyway, uh, enough of all that. If, if, if indeed we can sort of take this uh, intellectual leap and compare these two uh, in, in kind of a, in, uh, in, in, in this manner um, metaphorically, then um, maybe when someone heals, they're not really healed. Maybe they're actually in remission and maybe we can use that same term uh, to communicate this. And some of you have heard this, heard us and others talk about this before. And, you know, sometimes words are just that. They're just words, and they don't matter. But sometimes words are, you know, they're, they're coded, and, and they do matter. And when we use the word healed, sometimes folks' eyes glaze over. Um, and, they, and it immediately becomes 51st on their 50 most important things to do uh, because they've healed, and that problem is checked off their list. But I think all of us together know that when we go back to our clinic on Monday, that that is not going to be the case for our patients that have healed. Uh, they're they're, they're going to continuously have the same problems that set them up uh, uh, to begin with. So perhaps we should change, switch code and use the word remission. And this sounds like a little subtlety, touchy-feely thing, but I assure you, I think it's much more than that. Um, people understand when you use that word. Uh, remission, uh, the severity of the problem, and it helps to kind of, I think, corral uh, the sort of intellectual uh, uh, resources around this, and we've even just sort of put that out there for a little discussion uh, in the literature uh, in, the, uh, uh, in, in the recent past as well, in uh, uh, Warren Joseph's uh, wonderful journal, the uh, JAPMO, Journal of the American Podiatric Medical Association. So anyway, you don't hear too many folks talking about this, that I'm a five-year uh, wound survivor, do you? And maybe we, need to, maybe we need to do that. Or maybe we need to do something more clever as a people, uh, as, a, as, a, as a specialty in this area.
uh, to really own this. Uh, anyway, bless you. You don't have to cover up that sneeze, by the way. It sounded like a real robust one. By the way, when you sneeze, do you really trust the people that have the little baby sneezes, like the, <clears throat> like the little? I, I will always say that. You wonder what's going on behind their, their eyes. Because I don't trust, the, it's like people with a really clean, clean desk. You wonder. How many of you at home have a clean desk like that? Think about that. Is there really anything going on? Um, anyway, let's, let's talk about this. This, this is a, a stairway, and, and we're not going to get into uh, inordinate death, depth on this. <laughs> inordinate death? Uh, inordinate depth. Uh, this is not a stairway to heaven, uh, a la Robert Plant, but uh, rather a, a stairway uh, to amputation. Um, the good news about this stairway is that you can go up and down this stairway and if we collectively work together, uh, we could probably make a change. We're not going to touch on all of these things, but let's just understand that um, we can knock out any of these problems uh, for better or for worse. And if we, we can move up, uh, if we can uh, just increase activity a bit and get, people, get, get, get people's uh, a little bit more insulin sensitized or even just get them on some metformin, uh, we can reduce the risk of someone converting from impaired glucose homeostasis uh, uh, to, or pre-diabetes to diabetes uh, now, and there are data to support that. It's easy to talk about from the podium and at a meeting, especially when we're all eating, um, but, uh, and it's hard to do in real life, but it is very possible, and it's happening. Uh, neuropathy now uh, appears to, uh, it does appear that we can uh, modify the, uh, the natural history of neuropathy by getting people into better glucose control, better, maybe better triglyceride control. There are also uh, some data uh, to support uh, other supplementation that might be helpful. We had some nice discussions about that yesterday. But in the absence of that, when someone ulcerates, uh, there, we, we, or when someone has neuropathy, the next step is ulceration. Uh, we, we will talk a little bit about this as well in a moment. It's really pressure, time cycles of repetitive stress equals equals uh, inflammation, and maybe we can detect that. Maybe we can modulate these things by spreading force out over a larger unit area. You've had these great workshops that were oversubscribed uh, just a few minutes ago that talked all about that. You've already heard from great talks yesterday on, on infection. Those were awesome, and, and uh, so we're not going to get into that. We can do it in the Q&A if you want. Uh, ischemia, you also heard uh, 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 that discussed as well. It certainly complexifies all of this, and then finally on to amputation. The good news is, though, we can move up and down this, these categories, and if we team together, we can probably uh, improve care as well. But I will share this with you. Um, this, now, we've just flipped the stairway uh, over uh, from, uh, the, the, from high to low, and on the y-axis, what you see is uh, an impairment in sort of these patient-centered outcomes that many of us, uh, you know, always just bypass because it doesn't feel, these, these don't feel like hard endpoints to us, like these quality of life things in, in impairment. But you heard yesterday and the day before from uh, just tour de force talks by Fran Game uh, and others that these things probably do matter and uh, they probably matter a lot more than the things that we struggle with in terms of so-called endpoints. And then what you see on the x-axis going across are these, uh, these healthcare costs. Um, and this is just a conceptual diagram that, that I think probably corresponds to reality a great deal. And we see that if we can just keep people up in this neighborhood, actually Fran, I, I think maybe even used a very similar, if not the same paper, for, a paper this is a paper we wrote just a few months ago, um, then probably we can, we can affect a more positive change up here. But this kind of stuff is not very sexy. Uh, you know, when you start getting down here, then you start getting into a lot of fancy kinds of products and modalities that you can use, but you also get into higher costs. And many of these folks, by the time they get weighed down here, they're, in terms of function, it, it's hard. It's like you're circling a drain uh, of function, and maybe up, to, up top, we can make a difference, just conceptually. So let's think about that together as we kind of move forward on our little uh, uh, slide adventure and talk about how we're gonna prevent as we said, severe recurrence for, for our patient, uh, which is kind of like our therapeutic spouse in remission. And uh, so let's do that. Well, if, and if we're going to do it, I would, uh, I would argue as we kind of uh, move forward to this and, and, and move into this area, uh, I would suggest that we have to get smart. 
and uh, because I don't think that we have been in the past. And, and, and what I think I have, I've seen, and my frustration, and I think personally where I think I, I failed, um, is we, we get so enamored with um, many of the technologies for, for healing, and I think we probably should. I think some of them are very helpful. Um, that we forget about moving farther upstream. So here we are, let's uh, adhere to Maxwell Smart. And uh, so if we look at a diabetic foot ulcer, um, we really have uh, a, this sort of Venn diagram where we have three variables. But let's look at that, uh, let's look at these. In the face of neuropathy, so in the face of that loss of protective sensation, the loss of the gift of pain, as uh, Professor Brand taught us, we have pressure and activity. And when, when it comes to, to, to pressure, uh, we can spread force out uh, over a larger unit area, and you've seen uh, discussions on this, uh, and you've seen uh, already at this meeting uh, it, uh, with a great deal of, of detail in this area to, for offloading, for shoe wear, uh, we can do it. If we can't do it externally, uh, you also heard discussions, uh, particularly from uh, John Steinberg and others, about doing this internally through surgery, where you can uh, knock a prominent bump off or change the angle uh, of pull of a tendon or do an osteotomy and modify the way a foot hits the ground and spread that force out over a larger unit area. You can also do it in shoes by cushioning something. You can even spread uh, force out over time. So you can use those things. But we don't have to get into all of that, but we will in a minute. And then you, got act, then you have activity, which is pretty cool, because in, in the past, many of you know that this has been difficult to measure. How active are you, Mrs. Garcia? Um, how, how active are you, Mr. Smith? And you know, they say, well, I'm pretty active. And then you, then you get down to the uh, brass tacks, and it's very hard to actually measure this, therefore hard to manage. But the cool thing is, maybe if we can do both of these things, we can limit uh, the development of inflammation and then if we can limit the development of inflammation, we can limit the development of a blister in a wound, and then we can eliminate that cascade of crap that happens where they end up down uh, in, uh, in, in the situation where we have to be just putting out fires collectively. So here we go. Um, and oh, here we are. God didn't, you know, it's like I, I, I'm just finding out what's coming next slide-wise too, so I'm just like, like a, a riding on forward. This is, uh, well, you, you, I know you have, uh, you've all seen uh, uh, this man, but these are the two, uh, two of the most important people in the uh, insensitive uh, foot uh, in the uh, past uh, 100 years. And this is uh, Professor Paul Brand, uh, uh, raised during the Raj in India, um, and then uh, moved to uh, Louisiana and Carville, Louisiana, and uh, uh, ran the uh, Carville Leprosorium. And so many of these things we've learned from him. And uh, he's sort of the king of this area. And this is one of the crown princes. This is Professor Bolton. And I sort of carry their bags for them. But uh, I, that's, uh, I mean, this is about 15, 12, 15 years ago. Professor Brand has passed away. Uh, but uh, this, this fella is still around and uh, still uh, working real hard. Still real high maintenance, though, I must say. Um, uh, but uh, uh, keeping us busy. But Professor Brand said back in the day, and I don't know if I have it, yes he did, he used to say that wounds will heat up before they break down. And it appears that he was um, absolutely correct. Um, and uh, the, in that, that repetitive stress, uh, that both vertical and shear, led to you know, increases in inflammation. Actually, there are interesting data to suggest that you can detect some of these things even earlier uh, in, through blood work, uh, through increased proteases. Uh, I think Aris Fevis did some interesting work 10 or 15 years ago showing increases in MMP9 in people that were at this high risk for ulcerating. Uh, so that's a little bit uh, uh, inside baseball, but we can discuss that later if you want to as well. But uh, uh, the bottom line is there's likely an inflammatory event that maybe could be detected uh, to help us modulate that pressure and that activity in the patient. Uh, with neuropathy. So with that, we, we found that wounds will heat up before they break down. There was a series of studies that we and others did in the, first, uh, in the uh, uh, late 70s by, uh, uh, by Benbow and coworkers, and then later in the, uh, in the 80s. And this is all with Paul Brand's work. 
uh, and others then. Uh, we did work in the 90s that showed that we can see sometimes inflammation in an area several weeks even before uh, uh, the wound will break down. Then about 10 years ago, we found similar data uh, in, a, in a nested sample of patients in an even larger study. But we now have three separate randomized controlled studies uh, uh, that were federally sponsored that show that if we give people a personal inflammation monitor, like a little, then they can sort of dose their uh, activity by checking their inflammation, by checking their skin temperature, just like they might check their glucose and dose their insulin. And, and that's, to me, pretty exciting. The, the trouble is, you know, how, for, for these various companies, how do they build a business around this kind of thing? This is the, the, the seminal question. Um, uh, for us because this appears to show a pretty good signal for protection. Um, but uh, so, so there it is. It's like a personal inflammometer, if you will, just like there's a glucose meter. Well, there are uh, people that are uh, uh, suggesting, uh, and uh, there have been people wandering around uh, this meeting that are very, very talented, possibly uh, developing technologies that could do just that, things that might be in the home uh, that could actually uh, uh, where, where someone could step on a device and it could actually identify a hot spot and then relay that information uh, to the patient and then to the doctor, trend this information, and then feed it back. So that's one pretty, pretty good idea based on what we think is probably sound logic. So, uh, and, and so there it is. It's going to kind of ping you uh, when, you're in your, when, when you're in your bathroom, and that's great. So, so, so what else? What else is smart? Well, there are a lot of different ways to measure, uh, to measure activity now. This is one that uh, you've heard from a, a good uh, Professor Najafi uh, in, in the, uh, uh, that has been uh, doing some just really game-changing work uh, in wearables. Um, but we can identify with a great deal of precision, and we actually have, have much better gadgetry than this now through intelligent wearables and intelligent pendants and things like this. We can identify collection of activity, not just how many steps you're taking, but uh, how much you're standing, which appears to actually be associated with bad outcomes, um, what kind of activity that is, what position you're in when you're taking that activity, impulse, um, and, and these data now appear to be able to be signal processed, and they might be able to predict uh, bad outcomes. Even using the most simple uh, data, like steps with time stamped, like uh, it gives us we, we, can, we believe we can see, and we published this many years ago, um, variability in activity that, uh, that precedes an ulceration. In other words, just like you might have heart rate variability that changes before a cardiac event, so too uh, you might have uh, a, a activity variability that precedes a, an inflammation or a, a foot attack rather than a heart attack. So there you go. Buckle up because that's pretty cool. But what about some of the other items uh, that we have on our sort of get smart list as we sort of march down through this uh, in this area? Well, you saw, you heard a, lot, a little bit about this before, um, and, uh, and you've heard things like about, I've, uh, about falls and fall prevention. And a lot of our patients are, are unstable, um, not emotionally unstable like yours truly, but, uh, but just unstable, you know, in the, in the traditional sense uh, in terms of their stability. Wouldn't it be great if you can identify those people that uh, were perhaps either most frail or most at risk or pre-frail, as, uh, as many would say? And, and these, are work, uh, these are works from uh, Gertish Garawal and, and, and Bijan Najafi and, uh, and Michael Schwenk and others that are that doing a variety of very clever things uh, in, in our unit and others uh, to signal process these. And what you're starting to see is you're starting to see activity phenotypes in patients that are, that, that are potentially, well, we can at least dichotomize people or maybe even stratify people into these sort of phenotypes of activity, feed this into something as simple as our phone or as complex as our phone, and then actually give us, uh, as patients even, not just as, as doctors, but uh, information that might be able to predict the onset of a problem. And you also heard uh, not just Bijan talking about this, but uh, I think uh, uh, Nick Giovinco, who gave a couple of really awesome talks after he got his computer working uh, to, uh, uh, in, uh, on, that, uh, on day one uh, on this very subject. Well, and you've already heard about this as well. So a as we march toward uh, the, what's next and what's latest and what's available, smart socks may be promising as well. These are things that can measure pressure, temperature, and joint angle. So joint angle now, uh, you can look at excursion through the fiber optics, 
um, that, that could actually even predict uh, the failure uh, of, a, of a joint. So imagine this not only in, in feet, but in other uh, joints around the body. Imagine predicting a, a, a total hip going down just by wearing some smart underwear or something. Buckle up. That's kind of weird, but there you go. I, not that, maybe. All right. Um, the, the, uh, but uh, uh, point taken. So, we're, the, so uh, stay tuned on all that stuff. But now, now let's kind of put this together uh, and talk about what's been happening over the last, maybe the last couple of uh, generations just in, in, in this area. And we're going to talk about uh, sensory substitution. Now, um, uh, about 30 years ago, or 40 years ago, uh, Professor Brand uh, in people with diabetes, uh, or excuse me, in people with leprosy in Carville, Louisiana, were, were given people, they were putting a little pressure sensor in a heel that would alarm at a certain uh, amount of, uh, of pressure uh, and stress. That would then send a signal to the, uh, to, uh, to the patient uh, in their ear. The trouble was that the technology just was not, just was not there and it was, and it was too cumbersome. Uh, the, the form factor wasn't right, so, so these folks with, uh, with leprosy uh, you know, couldn't uh, you know could, couldn't fit this on, and they were, uh, and and these alarms uh, were going uh, unheeded. Uh, then uh, something. Uh, then in the 90s, uh, Larry Lavery and, and and others, and then we had a, another couple of uh, uh, studies since this with Steve Walker, and this is Fela Helm from UT Southwestern, um, did something similar, and they actually developed. I'll I'll just show you uh, a, a pretty cool uh, sensor and insole material, and that sensor when someone stepped on it. Uh, would, uh, would send basically into a series of uh, uh, mono-oral Beats headphones uh, into, uh, uh, into your ear uh, and, uh, and then could potentially even uh, theoretically train someone uh, uh, into a better gait. And the data actually were rather interesting. It appeared that uh, people at the time, even with this very crude method, um, could modify their gait patterns. Uh, in response to these, uh, to, to these signals. Um, but still, the form factor is not right. Technology uh, may not be there. It's a great idea um, for this high-risk group, but maybe not yet ready for prime time. But, um, but, but what about this? And you could, you could uh, turn down the volume, um, but, uh, but, the, but what you see here, or you can keep the volume up. That's cool, too. Um, but, uh, but, but this really caught our attention, and, and uh, I'll just... I'll just tell you, FYI, this, th this idea was developed by a, um, a young uh, plastic surgeon, uh, Brianne Everett, now Brianne Minty, um, uh, who just had a baby, by the way, in Calgary. And she saw a problem, actually, and she, uh, in the diabetic foot, and she saw some of the works that had come before, and um, she thought maybe she could do something about it, maybe a little bit better, and, and this is kind of where where, where, where this all uh, uh, comes about, and I'll just show you some of this. Um, but essentially imagine now uh, that you have this, uh, this patient with neuropathy um, and with, uh, with loss of protective sensation, if you will, um, and then imagine you can give them a pair of sort of magic, magic insoles um, that uh, could uh, go in and be uh, uh, fitting appropriately plexed out with sensors to measure pressure, then those data could be wirelessly transmitted uh, to, uh, in, in this case, now there's a, there's a, a couple of versions of these, of these uh, devices, one that's uh, already ready for prime time and another that's, uh, that has been uh, worked on, but I'll just show you these, these things because it's pretty damn clever. This gets sent uh, then to, imagine a shirt that you could put on that actually sends it uh, with a homunculus on the back that could actually give information. Uh, maybe up here is your big toe. It's like a map of your, uh, of your body. Down here is your heel if you have too high a pressure. Uh, and, uh, and then pretty soon your, your brain is so plastic it, it uh, actually adapts to this and you can modify your gait based on this. Well, that's pretty cool. And it's not unlike other kinds of technologies that have, that, that have been working. Now this has been improved in terms of form factor into... Uh, something, something like this, just to a watch where you like, have a smart watch, basically, and uh, and that I've, I got one on right now. Actually, it's pretty, they're, 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 but but uh, these things now actually can send information 
uh, yeah, that, to give you or the, you know, your patient, I should say, uh, that information about high pressure and then modify, allow people to modify their activity uh, based on that. And then ultimately, uh, build up a library uh, of uh, collected steps and force and then help, and then, and then that actually could be trended and then uh, modify things over time. And this caught our attention because we thought it was really, really clever and we think it could be a way forward, especially with all the things you've heard about uh, outside this, or at, at the early part of this meeting with wearables uh, and with consumer-based products. So this is so what we're really seeing now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is we're seeing this inexorable merger of consumer tech with medical devices, and the lines have been blurred, and we had a lot of discussion about this uh, on Thursday, but this is the first of what is likely to be many kinds of things that we're all going to be using um, in, uh, in, in, taking care of, uh, in taking care of our patients. Oop, oh, oh, I'll go back. Let me do this. I'm going I'm to show you this. You're going to love this. I'm going to show you. Uh, so I haven't shown this video in forever, but several years ago, I was in, uh, uh, I think I was in Zagreb, actually, and I was watching this, like the equivalent of ESPN 2, and it was in the middle of the night, and I couldn't sleep like usual, and I was like, I saw this, I fell off the bed, so I'll share it with you. Um, the, the, uh, so uh, here's this bike race, and uh, you know, these, uh, this guy's out in front, but then these two guys, the interesting thing is these guys that are jockeying for second, and uh, you got one guy and the other guy, and they're racing. And this guy cheats. Yeah, yeah, I know. But this other guy's got someone that's watching his six for him. And he's got like a whole posse. And, and no kidding, watch this. And yeah, and, yeah, I know, I know, I know. I felt the same way. And, and I saw this, and I was like in the, like the, basically like the Motel 6 in Zagreb. And I fell off the bed, and I was just laughing. I said, this is impossible. Um, and... Um, but I said to myself, um, this, wouldn't it be awesome if we, as a family, could get to the truth this quickly, like, you know, to figure out what's real and what's not, um, and, and, and uh, either in the operating room, in clinic, in real life. But the, the, cool, the cool thing is that I think we're marching uh, 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 toward, the truth, toward the truth, and, you know, just like you, immediately, I thought, uh, when I saw this race, I thought of... Uh, um, uh, Shakespeare, um, and uh, and uh, <laughs> and I, I, I actually did because I, I was reading a bedtime story to my daughters, and, and there's a great line uh, from uh, it, uh, here in uh, uh, in Measure for Measure, which isn't my favorite. I mean, but it, but uh, this is when Antonia is still a nun, and she's trying to hook up with the Duke, or vice versa, more likely. And uh, and, and 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 this line is uttered. Uh, uh, truth is truth to the end of reckoning, and, and I believe that. I think ultimately there's like a reckoning, and we get to that truth, but usually we have to march forward and then take steps back, and we get to it, and that's why we come together at meetings like this, frankly, and, and, and uh, what's, what's really cool is that I think we're slowly, and I think hopefully you've seen this build up in the last few minutes together, um, where we're getting to the point where we may have some control over this upstream destiny in trying to, trying to help uh, our, our, our patients earlier and earlier, and how this works, um, I think, is all of our guess. But I think now we start are starting to have some tools um, that might really, really help us, and we'll see. Um, but it's 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 early days. But I tell you what, it's uh, strange days, but exciting days, and I think uh, it's going to help a lot of people. And I think that's what we all deserve uh, together, whether we have uh, diabetes or not. Uh, and with that. I thank you so much. And uh, we have time for, uh, for any questions you might have. Yes, ma'am. By the way, march up to the mic and let's go. We can talk about anything. Feet, life, bike racing, Zagreb. Good morning. It's very intimidating with all these great minds around, but as a nurse, I for just For me too. To I, am, I, I tell you what. These guys freak me out, all these smarty pants characters. I know, me too. But I just wanted to say as a nurse, you know, over the years, we've come to uh, have zero tolerance for pressure ulcers. I would like to see us move towards zero tolerance for di the diabetic foot ulcer. And what we've seen over the last three days is this huge tsunami of these patients that will hit us 
in the upcoming years, which is great for our, our pockets, but uh, you know, how, how sad for our population. And I would love to see, as we have um, people with breast cancer, that women go for their annual screenings. It's second nature. We don't tend to question that anymore. But I know so many diabetics that don't even think about going and getting their feet checked annually, let alone, you know, uh, more frequently if they're at high risk. And I would like to see diabetics, when they're first diagnosed, that the team is brought in for prevention of the complications with their feet. Um, and that can be through simple teaching with nurses, with basic hygiene, doing assessments, a simple one-on-one -on -one teaching or with groups. And I just, I think we've got to go, I mean, this, all this technology is awesome, but we've got to go back to that, that er, those early, early days. And I don't know how we're gonna do it. Maybe these great minds will, will help me do it. Um, so well, that's well, my thought. Well, it's not only, it's, it, it, this is a, this is critical and uh, the, this is the discussion actually we were having just, uh, just, just before I was walking in here, in fact even as we were walking in here, how can we um, effect, effect change uh, globally um, when we leave here, right? Because we all, you know, we can, we can come together and it could be like kumbaya and we're all very happy, happy, joy, joy, and then we leave and what's next on, on Monday, right? Um, other than being jet lagged for you. Uh, and I think that... I'm from San Diego, actually. San Diego? That's where I work. Oh, I can tell. <laughs> yes, you have, you have a, you're from uh, Eastern San Diego, aren't you? Yes, very good. San Diego on the Thames, yes? Okay, the, the, um, but uh, the, anyway, uh, the, the, wherever we're from, jet lagged or not, uh, the the uh, uh, we, when we go back uh, 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 to work, we have to uh, decide where we want to put our resources, and it would be wonderful um, if we were able to uh, band together, perhaps in a society that was working 24/7 um, toward this problem, advocating uh, for these kinds of things, perhaps uh, taking giving political cover to people to try to. A grandstand about these sorts of things um, and, and to try to get resources put into things that you're talking about, like screening um, and getting out in front of these problems um, before they ever happen. Because I do believe that one does not need, um, a, one, one could probably do a lot of this screening with, uh, with, uh, with techs and with uh, um, uh, 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 LVNs and then march it up. To, to nurses and, and physician extenders and physicians as well as you move up in risk category. And I think the data have emerged that this could be a promising mode. I think, however, that particularly initially in the developed world, but then as we move into the developing world, um, we could take some of the things that we take for granted and uh, some of the technology that we take for granted, like our cell phones, right? Or like some of these wearables. And I think that these things uh, t take it out of our hands and they empower the patient, do you see? And, and we have more and more patients that are more and more, uh, and you're gonna say, well, they're not my patients that are, that are this savvy, but there's more and more every day that are coming in with information and they all have uh, you know, uh, flip phones at least, but certainly most have smartphones now actually, it's uh, every single year. And I think the data that we're able to get from the things that, we've, that we're talking about is going to become more and more ubiquitous, and that's a tsunami as well. So I think we can ride both of those, uh, you know, maybe even in San Diego is what I'm thinking. How's that? I'll get my board shorts. Yes, uh, that, that Dr. Uh, Najafi. Excellent talk as usual. Um, I, I have a question. I, I actually, let's I give first a background. Um, as you know, a few years ago, there was a paper published in Nature suggesting barefoot running reduced collision impact and force and pressure, and therefore maybe reduced injury. And a couple of years later, we, we find out that actually is not the case, barefoot increased injury. Um, when, when you're talking about training patients to alter gait, to reduce pressure, 
I understand the concept of reduction of the pressure that's very important for the patient, but teach them to alter the gait. This is the concern that I have. I'm just wondering that whether this is the right way to do, whether there is any study that demonstrates that this is the right thing to do for the patient in long term. Well, the, the, only, the, the data that exists about altering gait uh, in the, uh, um, uh, the medium term, there are data that exist from uh, Mike Miller and coworkers. I think you're probably aware from uh, Wash U in, 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 in St. Louis for, for partial foot amputees and others suggesting that you can have uh, reductions in plantar pressure in those patients by modulating, by modulating gait. The feedback, though, is, one, is something that is entirely new. Um, at, at why? Because we can now give real-time feedback to, to people, uh, to, to, to patients. And those data are the patient's data, I think, not just our, our data. And we can share that with the patient. And, and what happens is this stuff can start to really um, engage with them. Some of the most um, useful things that we have found when we're working with patients have been to show them where a high pressure point is on their foot. Um, in fact, uh, I think Loretta Villaquite did uh, 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 work in this area and, and others, but where, where one can actually show someone where, a, where a, uh, a, a dark spot is, just using almost like an ink mat, an old Harris mat, but, but modulated, and that actually could give a visual assessment. Some of the stuff that we're talking about now can do that, but can do it in real time and deliver real information. That's what's exciting about me, uh, for, for me, and my hope ultimately, and, and I don't think this is the hope of any um, uh, specific, this may be antithetical to all of these different companies that are emerging in the area and whatnot, but it's, it's what I'm thinking at least, I, and I don't have much of an internal monologue as you can tell, Dr. Najavi, is that it would be really great, and I think this is what is going to happen, that we all, we're going to move into something as of a subscription economy to these things, where we are not going to be asking, well, what's the code for that thing? Or what's the, how do I bill for this? Um, but maybe the doctor and the nurse might have these things available in their office. Maybe they, they could deliver it to someone. But also, these people might be able to get some of these things on their own as well. And maybe they could have a... Uh, subscription to something like this. Uh, not unlike they have a subscription to their wireless phone uh, which, uh, or, or to their, um, or to something like, and maybe it could be subsidized in ma that manner, like some wireless phones are, with an early termination fee or something. But I think you see all of the, or just like they have their Hulu or their Netflix, this is, they're, they're uh, these things, and then you can add little bits and pieces to this, but this kind of thing engages people. Um, and they have a little so-called skin in the game, but it also, the payoff is that they can be in their home uh, and, more, and more active, bless you, and safer um, rather, than, uh, rather than laid up somewhere like in a hospital with a big wound like they used to have uh, uh, earlier. Or maybe the subscription for this new phone bill or something goes to um, you, Dr. Najafi, because you're worried about your mother in her home living by herself, and you, you're afraid that she's going to get a sore on her foot, or you're afraid that she's going to fall. Maybe it would be worth it to you, personally, uh, to, uh, to, to pay a little bit of money in a subscription to keep her safe in the house where, she, where you grew up, right? And I think this, to me, um, because this, well, the biggest frustration I've had, Bijan, over the years is that um, I think we see where things could be, but yet um, when we look at industry, um, the, it, it, these companies are not set up to, to do this. But now I think they are because these, this, something's happening There's a, uh, with, with these consumer gadgets. And I think maybe, we, maybe most of the people in the room disagree, but I... I We'll see. We'll see. We'll see what happens. Yes, sir. Hi, David. Ah, uh, I can't even see. I could see your, okay. your flash of white Italian hair, hey. as they say. Luigi Italian. Uh, nice talk as usual. Uh, 
Uh, you know, is um, I uh, I um, like the philosophy. We we just uh, try to restore uh, something that we have lost. So it's wonderful. But we uh, uh, deal with costs. So I don't think that we can uh, apply a system like that to all neuropathic patients. Because we know that we are uh, at least one third of diabetic patients that have neuropathy. So uh, I think that we should select patients. So the uh, most attractive group of patients should be the patients that have already had yes. a, a, a neuropathic ulcer. So uh, I think that uh, we have to, to discuss about two points. The first one is that those patients should have, uh, in any case, shoes and insoles. And uh, uh, you know that one of the problems that we have is that uh, no all patients wear the, the, the right shoes and the right insoles. And then I think that we, if we put this system on the top of shoes and insole, it's very easy to yeah. demonstrate with a cost effectiveness study that to have this kind of feedback is useful for the, for the patient. Okay, brilliant, Luigi, as usual. And I, for those of you who don't know, uh, a good professor uh, Uccioli wrote um, the, the classic paper in 1995. God, it's 1995, Luigi. No kidding. You are, that, that's just, it doesn't show. Here. But uh, the, uh, on uh, the effect of custom insoles on, 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 on ulceration that started uh, a 20-year you know, 20, uh, 20 discussion now. On, on this subject, and it's like the seminal paper that was that was first done, and and um, so what you're talking about is going after the um, people with the highest effect size, the people in remission that are very likely to recur. And I would uh, agree with you 100%. In fact, that's that was what, where we kind of went with our kind of thought experiment through this whole talk, uh, and I think that's the perfect place to be. However, what I would love would be for people to maybe catch on to something like this uh, and, then, and, and then to adopt, uh, to adopt this further and further upstream, uh, maybe even before they got, got some of these severe problems. And maybe that's where things start because if you look at a histogram of cost, there was a great talk um, at this meeting, there was one as well, and then, but also on the other coast in our sister meeting, the DLS meeting, um, uh, there was a, a, a terrific talk uh, by the, uh, the VP for Health Affairs for um, the MedStar system that looked at the 30,000 or so people that were under contract by, uh, at, at MedStar, and they found that something like 80% of the cost, 85% of the cost for these 30,000, 35,000 person population were borne by something like 1,300 of, per, uh, 1300 of these patients. And then when you drill down further into the histogram, there were just a few hundred or that, that bore th uh, 70 or 80 percent of that, uh, those costs. So you can identify these, these people that are, it's just they're so difficult, their lives are so difficult. And many of those patients were the ones that were in the wound center at Georgetown. And so you know where these people are. Uh, but the key is to try to get them healed, and as you heard Fran Game say, maybe things like this can give people more ulcer-free days. Uh, and maybe that's the, and, and maybe it can keep them, even more importantly than that, keep them walking in their home. And that's what might connote the highest quality of life. So I, that's, if you want to talk about the, the whole enchilada, as they say in Italy, uh, that's what I would say. Outstanding. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ostrand. Uh, first conference for me here in LA. Well, welcome. Great, you guys are, did a fantastic job. Isn't Dr. Luigi good too, by the way? He's awesome. Yeah, Dr. Perez from New York. I just want to add on what the doctor for San Diego was saying. Uh, there's a lot of emphasis on foot ulcers, taking care of the problem. She was talking about taking, try to do something to prevent them beforehand. And I just want to share, uh, experience, uh, I think podiatrists are in a position when the patients feel very comfortable with you, you can actually have a great deal of influence on the patient. A lady, diabetic since 86, 1986, obese, 
COPD, high blood pressure, everything under the sun, ulcer on the foot, smoking a pack a day. And I took it pretty personal. And I've been working with this lady. And I had to say that after one year, her ulcers are gone. She lost about 15 pounds. And she's only smoking two or three cigarettes a day. So she's been a smoker all her life. So what I want to emphasize is that, yes, we can make orthotics. We can give shoots. We can heal ulcers. We can do all of that. But also, if you have influence on the patient and stress that they take care of their sugars, that they take care of what they eat, and you'll be amazed what influence you can have on these patients if you really uh, take a little time and talk to them and tell them, I expect you to come back a little lighter or uh, a little better. Thank you. Well, well, well I, I look, from your mouth to God's ears, uh, and I think that that's a great way to, to, to you know, if we, we, if we can marry not only this high tech, but with uh, high touch. And I think probably we're all here right now, and also all of you in your pajamas at home um, are, uh, are here because that's the feeling that you always want to emulate, right? It's almost, it's the best feeling in the world, is the feeling like you're making a difference. And, 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 and I think that's probably why we come together and, and, and we want to have more of that. And maybe we can. And I think that's, it's like my pop used to say, folks don't care how much you know uh, until they know how much you care, right? And so, terrific. Yes, sir, final question. We have uh, four minutes, 25 seconds left. Four minutes, 23, oh my God. Better hurry, here we go. Uh, many of us come from parts of the world where for a variety of cultural and social reasons, patients don't wear their shoes in the house. Uh, I come from the Northwest, it rains a lot, that's why they call me Oregon Ducks. And so um, we're trying to figure out a way that we can, uh, if, if you can't encourage them to go there, if their choice is to go in the house without a shoe on, mm. what have you found? I know in the Arizona area, people take their sandals off. W what kind of strategies or thoughts have you come up with with patients to um, work together to come to some agreement on what might work in the house? Yeah, um, well, you know, if you, um, if you were to look at some of the really clever things uh, that you saw um, uh, the, uh, Dr. Varma showing um, from, uh, from India, we can apply some of those things um, to hot environments uh, and humid environments and wet environments, um, but also to the home environment. Uh, many years ago, we found that fewer than, um, fewer than, or less than about 15% of activity uh, is taken outside the home. Interestingly, so if we can get it for some of our patients, for our highest risk patients, so if we can get uh, something at home that can protect them, I think we could probably do better as well. And I think that uh, that some of the things we do, especially for people that have uh, have already had ulcers, is sometimes we just try to refashion uh, like a healing sandal that we've already had made for them, or like a, one of those. Uh, a, a pressure a DH uh, sandals or some of those other things that have, that have been made for them and just continuously repurpose them for them to use in the home. Um, but the trouble is, is that that turns into sort of an ugly situation maybe because they just don't look good and they don't feel like flip-flops. So some of the other things that you saw that actually look lovely are, are ways forward. And I think that, by the way, is a huge unmet need in our, um, in our space because we still make shoes that look um, that look like you know like they belong in the, uh, the, the some sort of uh, uh, Dickensian uh, uh, kind of uh, the horrible uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, environment where people are just trot trotting around and they look like something like our great grandparents would wear. Maybe we can make them more attractive. And I think there are people trying to do that. And I think you're seeing some of it out there in the in the uh, uh, in the exhibit hall. But I think uh, we just have to get out and get a little bit more clever in that area. But what we do is we give people um, their healing sandal. And you can also have some of your local prosthetists make home sandals for them with a multi-laminar, multi, multi durometer inlay. And some of these technologies that can identify pressure can, just, can be used in those just as easily as they can be used in a big, uh, you know, high-top boot. So there you have it. <laughs>